Hi guys, today we will be discussing chapter 5, the skeletal system. So we have the parts of the skeletal system. First is the bone, joints, cartilage, and ligament. We will be discussing more about the bones since we have 206 bones in the human body. Now, it is divided into two divisions which is axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton, which will be discussed further on this topic. So the functions of the bone, one is to support the body. No, it mainly support the body. It acts as a structural framework of our body. Next is for protection of the soft organ. So what are those soft organs? Say for example, our heart and lungs is enclosed with our thorax. And our brain, which is also a soft organ, is also enclosed with a skull. So movement due to attached skeletal muscle. Together with the skeletal muscle, our bone acts and function for movement of the body. So more, more discussion on our skeletal muscle will be on our muscular system. So the storage of minerals and fats. What are these types of minerals? One example is your calcium. Once calcium is depleted in the blood, our bone compensates for the loss of calcium in the blood. So it will destroy the, the bone cell so, so that calcium will be released and transported to our blood. Lastly is blood cell formation. One example is our femur. Our femur has a medulla that is rich in bone marrow, and bone marrow is rich in stem cells. Stem cells differentiate into other types of cells. Uh, one example of this cell is our blood cell. So the skeleton has 206 bones. It has two basic types of bone tissue, which is compact bone and spongy bone. Compact bone is homogeneous, while spongy bone is in needle-like pieces of bones, many open spaces. So this is a misnomer because some people think it is spongy and it is soft. But it is called spongy because it contains spaces in its trabeculae. Okay, it is also known as your cancellous bones. So moving on to our classification of bone, we have long bones and short bones. So when we say long bone, it's typically longer than they are wide. They have shafts with heads at both ends and contain mostly compact bone. One example of the long bones is femur and our humerus. No? A femur is the longest bone in our body. So short bone is generally cube-shaped and it contains mostly spongy bone. So some example of it is carpal and tarsal. So that's the difference between short bone and long bone. When we say long bone, it contains mostly compact bone, and our short bone contains mostly the spongy bones. Two other classification according to shape is your flat bone and your irregular bones. So flat bones are thin and flat and usually curved. They can be found in skull ribs and sternum. So the difference there is between long, short, and flat bone is that flat bone has a thin layer of compact bone around the layer of a sponge bone. While these irregular bones are easy to classify because any, any bone that does not fit any of the three categories stated before is categorized as your irregular bones. On to the gross anatomy of the long bone, we have the diaphysis right here and the epiphysis is right here. So diaphysis is a shaft. It's long and it is composed of a compact bone. Epiphysis is at the end of each bone. It is composed mostly of the spongy bone. So we have the structure of a long bone. Uh, two important parts of a long bone is the periosteum and the endosteum. So this too is a covering. Periosteum is the outside covering and the endosteum is the inner covering near the yellow bone marrow. Another part of our long bone is the articular cartilage. It can be found at the top of the epiphysis. Its main function is to decrease the friction at joint surfaces since this epiphysis is connected to another bone's epiphysis. So this articular cartilage is made up of hyaline cartilage. So we have a medullary cavity. So it, it, it is in the middle of the shaft of the diaphysis. So it contains the yellow marrow and the red bone marrow. The yellow marrow is mostly fat and it is a fat deposit uh, inside the bone. The yellow marrow can be converted into red marrow to increase blood cell production when in cases of severe blood loss. This is a bone, which is an organ level. If we cut a part of that bone and view it inside a microscope, 
we can we will see a cortical bone. If we once again zoom in that cortical bone, we will see an ostrum. An ostrum is a unit of bone. It is also known as your Habersian system. In the middle of the ostrum, there is an opening that we call the central canal or the Habersian canal. It is consists of your blood vessel and your nerves. Okay. If we if we see inside that cortical bone, we will see a perpendicular canal connecting two central canal. This is what we call perforating canal or Boxman canal. Here is an overview of the microscopic anatomy of the bone. This is an ostrum, so it has a lamellae, which are rings around the central canal. So they are the sites of lacunae. So uh, we also have lacunae, which is a cavity containing the bone cells, or what we call the osteocytes. They are arranged in concentric circles. We also have canaliculi, which are tiny canals that radiate from the central canal to the lacunae. There's a lot of changes in the human skeleton starting when we were young until it gets old. So in the embryo, the skeleton is primarily hyaline cartilage. During development, much of this cartilage is replaced by our bone. Cartilage remain in isolated areas like the bridge of the nose, the part of the ribs, and the joints. If official plates allow for growth of long bone during childhood, long bones stop growing at around the age of 18 in females and the age of 21 in males. This process is called if official plate closure. We have three types of bone cell. We have osteocytes, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. Osteocytes are mature bone cells situated in your lacunae, so they are sometimes latent or inactive. Osteoblasts are bone-forming cells. I like to remember it as letter B for BB, meaning they are still young and uh, forming cells. Osteoblasts are bone-destroying cells, so they are breakdown uh, for remodeling and release of calcium whenever your blood level calcium is depleted. Bone fracture, so it is a break in the bone. So there are two types, major types, the close and open. When we say close, it does not penetrate outside the skin, meaning hindi lumalabas yung buto. While in open, it penetrates outside the skin. The following are different types of your bone fracture. After the bone fracture, it will start healing. The repair will start on the hematoma. A hematoma formation is a blood-filled swelling, so it will swell. The break where the fracture is is splinted by a fibrocartilage to form a callus. A fibrocartilage callus is replaced by a bony structure illustrated in the number 3 picture. On the number 4 illustration, the bony callus is remodeled to form a permanent patch. The axial skeleton forms the longitudinal part of our body. So it is divided into three parts which are the skull, the vertebral column, and the bony thorax. Let's start with your skull. So there are two sets of bones, the cranium and the facial bones. Bones are joined by a suture which is similar to a line that connects the two bones. The major bone of your cranium part of the skull is the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the temporal bone, and your occipital bone. This bone is connected by sutures. The yellow frontal bone is connected to the green parietal bone by coronal suture. The green parietal bone is connected to the orange temporal bone by... <laughs> This bone is connected by suture. The yellow frontal bone is connected to the green parietal bone by coronal suture. The green parietal bone is connected to the orange temporal bone by your squamosal or squamous suture. The green parietal bone is connected to your brown occipital bone by your lambdoid or lambdoidal suture. The left and right green parietal bone is connected by a sagittal suture which is not written in this illustration. The pink sphenoid bone is the butterfly-shaped bone that forms part of the interior floor and sides of the cranium, while the ethmoid bone, which is color orange, forms the middle portion of the interior cranial floor extending inferiorly between the eye orbit. You have to memorize all the parts and the function. Maybe a mnemonics can help you memorize them better.
There is also a long list of table of the bone markings in your laboratory book that can help you on categorizing and uh, memorizing the general meaning of a certain bone marking. The most commonly discussed sinus is the paranasal sinus. These are the hollow portion of your bones surrounding the nasal cavity. So this is where the sinusitis term is used, where it is the inflammation of your paranasal sinuses. The hyoid bone is not really a part of vertebral column, but in your laboratory book, it is considered as part. This bone is a U-shaped bone in the throat. It serves as an attachment for tongue muscle and connective tissue associated with the larynx or your voice box. This is a fetal skull. Because the flat bones of their cranium have not met to form suture, there are six fibrous areas called fontanelles. There are 26 bones of the vertebral column. They are divided among the bones listed in the illustration. So we have 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, 5 large lumbar vertebrae, and your coccyx and sacrum. The seven cervical vertebrae is divided into C1 to C7. The first two uh, cervical vertebrae is named. The first one, C1, is also known as your atlas. It is a ring-like vertebra that supports the skull by forming a joint with the occipital condyles. The second one is your axis, which is your C2. It is remarkable for its dense or odontoid, which is a tooth-like process. You have 25 bones of the rib cage or the thoracic cage. It forms a partially flexible protective shield for the heart, lungs, and other thoracic organs. The thoracic cage also helps protect some organs of the upper abdomen such as the liver and the spleen. Your appendicular skeleton is divided into three. These are your limbs, your pectoral girdle, and your, and your pelvic girdle. Your appendicular skeleton consists of all 126 bones that form the upper and lower extremities. The shoulder, girdle, and the arms or the upper extremities have 64 bones altogether, whereas the pelvic girdle and the legs have a total of 62 bones. Let's start with your shoulder girdle. It is composed of two bones, the clavicle and your scapula. The bones allow the upper limb to have exceptionally free movement. The scapula or the shoulder blade forms part of your shoulder girdle that supports the arm, while the clavicle or collarbone is the other bone of the shoulder girdle. The clavicle is a long bone whose long axis lies along a horizontal axis on the anterior superior aspect of the thoracic cage. Moving on to your upper limb, let's start with your humerus. The humerus is the large long bone of the upper arm. On your lower arm, it is divided into two, which is your radius and your ulna. Radius is the one in line with your thumb, while your ulna is the one in line with your pinky finger. I'd like to think that ulna is ulliit because ulna for hinliliit. Moving on, your hand is divided into three, your carpal or your wrist, your metacarpals or your palm, and your palanches or, you, or your fingers. Here is a good mnemonic that can make you memorize your carpal bone better. Your pelvic girdle is divided into three fused bones. It is paired. So we have the ilium, the ischium, and the pubic bone. Pelvic girdle is also called your hip bones. The male pelvis can be distinguished from the female pelvis because it is usually larger and more massive, but the female pelvis tends to be broader. Also, the subpubic angle is greater in the female. The increase in size of this opening helps accommodate the fetus during childbirth. In your lower limb, we have femur. Femur is a thigh bone and is the longest bone in the body. Your lower limbs has two bones, which is the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is the shin bone, which is larger than the fibula. I like to remember it as tibia as taba and fibula as fayat. Your foot is divided into three, your tarsus or your ankle, your metatarsals or your sole, your phalanges or your toes. Here are some mnemonics of your tarsal bones that can help you. The most important thing to know about joint is that they hold the bones together. The joints is divided or classified into two types, which is your functional and structural. 
we have three functional classification of our joints. The immovable joints or synarthrosis, the slightly movable joints or amphiarthrosis, and the freely movable joints or the diarthrosis. Structurally, the joint is divided into three, the fibrous, cartilaginous, and the synovial joints, which is freely movable like those of the knees. Fibrous joints are bones united by fibrous tissue. One example of this is that of the sutures or the lines that can be found in the skull that connects the cranial bones. Cartilaginous joints are those joints that is made up of cartilage. So an example of this is pubic symphysis near your pelvic girdle and your intervertebral joints that holds your uh, vertebral column. Synovial joints are those joints that can be found in articulating bones separated by a cavity. A synovial fluid is found in that joint cavity. These are the inflammatory conditions associated with joints. The most common one is your arthritis, which is an inflammatory or degenerative disease of the joint. Here are the clinical forms of arthritis. One is osteoarthritis, which is the most common. Second is rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease. Lastly is your gout or arthritis gout. It is a deposit of your uric acid in the joint. That's all for your skeletal system and I hope you've learned from today's video. Please read your book, study and memorize the function of the bones, the bones and the bone markings.